Immunity passports are digital or physical documents that certify that an individual has been infected with and is purportedly immune to SARS-CoV-2 and that they can't get reinfected or transmit it to other people. The idea is that individuals in possession of an immunity passport would be exempt from physical restrictions and could return to work, school and other daily activities. Vaccine at least many months away, a number of countries are looking into ways to ease restrictive physical distancing measures to reduce the economic impact of COVID-19. There have been reports that the United States, the United Kingdom, Italy, Germany and Chile have all been looking into using immunity passports. But the reality is immunity passports are not a silver bullet and they pose significant scientific, legal and equitable issues. There's a lot we don't yet know about immunity and COVID-19. If you get infected and recover, are you then immune to reinfection? If so, how long does that immunity last? Three months, three years, a lifetime? Does it depend on how sick you get in the first place? Are antibodies detected by existing tests informative about immunity and how accurate are those tests? If you get a false positive and that indicates that you're immune, but you're not, an immunity passport might say you are safe to go to work when you're not, putting not only yourself at risk, but others also at risk. The likelihood is that infection does convey some form of immunity with SARS-CoV-2. And so while we can make some assumptions and some informed guesses, that's not yet a sufficient basis for a document that determines who can and cannot access society and the economic benefits that that comes with. Scientific viability is not the only issue with immunity passports. Immunity passports create an artificial restriction on who can and cannot participate in social, civic and economic activities in society. As a result, they also create a perverse incentive for individuals to seek out infection, particularly people who aren't able to afford a period of workforce exclusion, compounding existing gender, race, ethnic, national and other inequities in society. This perverse incentive would pose a risk not only to those individuals themselves, but also to the people that they come into contact with. We're also increasingly seeing that COVID-19 can have some significant long-term health harm. It's not a matter of simply getting sick and recovering in a couple of weeks. Like all such privileges administered by government, immunity passports are ripe for corruption and bias. Existing socioeconomic, racial and ethnic inequities might be reflected in the administration of such certification, governing who can access antibody testing in the first place, who is front of the queue for certification and whose certificates are actually accepted in society. By replicating existing inequalities, immunity passports would exacerbate the harm inflicted by COVID-19 on already vulnerable populations. Finally, immunity passports also risk alleviating the duty on governments to adopt policies in light of COVID-19 to protect economic, housing and health rights across society by providing an apparent quick fix that might actually cause significant harm. Immunity passports inherently create indirect discrimination against those who are more vulnerable to the serious impacts of COVID-19 and who can't put their health at risk by, by going and getting infected, such as the elderly, people with chronic illness or disabilities and pregnant women. The privilege of immunity compounds existing discrimination and while the law does currently attempt to cover certain individuals and health status, it tends to not be immunity and it's not appropriately defined to cope with this idea of immunoprivilege.